There is a variety of love. Even in the scripture, there is different types of love. And uh, when it comes to this kind of love, the love between the man and the woman in a marriage relationship, the Bible is not talking about a love that happens at first sight, a Hollywood love, that kind of romantic love. Uh, there is nothing wrong with romance, and there is romance in fact. It will happen as we read the scriptures between any man and woman that God joins them. But the love should not be mixed up with lust or sexual perversion. Your love should have nothing to do with sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 to 8 we read the characteristics of this type of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it doesn't boast, it is not proud, it doesn't dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil or rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always preserves. Now, if you meet all that, when you saw your wife to be, or your wife that you are married to now, then you are on the right path. I'll tell you a little story. When I first met my wife to be, for the first time, there was no love at first sight like that, like Hollywood movies. I'll tell you that from either side. But God told me, this is your wife. I'm not going to go into details of the story, how we met and all that. But the story is, briefly, that we met in a place that, you know, I was casually going through. And we met. And I had no desire to even stop in that place for an extra second. And I was rushing out, but my friend, a friend of mine who was driving me through, and I was in his car, stopped by and started talking to this lady, who is my wife now. And uh, when we started talking, and as I was listening, and it wasn't anything extraordinary, the conversation was totally normal and ordinary, daily conversation. And God told me, this is your wife. We met again, and I suggested the idea of friendship with the goal of marriage at the end. Now, I explained to her that what I meant by that was that I want a relationship with a person that ultimately will lead to marriage, if things go well. If things don't work, then we go our own ways. But I knew for sure, that she was my wife. The story is on the other side, God had spoken to her too. That God would bring to her the right person. God put that desire in her heart. When just before that, she had absolutely no desire to get married. She was planning to be a missionary in some remote island. But God put that desire in her heart to be married. Now we're doing our mission and things are happening a different way. However, it's a long story. God put that desire in her heart, God put that desire in my heart. When we saw each other, we didn't fall, we didn't fall in love, we didn't melt, but the love was there immediately. The love, this type of love, that was patient, kind, and didn't have any envy, didn't boast, no pride in it and all that in such a way that I just felt she is part of me. She is an extension of my body. She is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. And the same thing happened to her but the, the desire was so strong that she didn't want to get married at the time and she thought she'd go it wrong 
So she pleaded with God to take that desire away and God took that desire away. She said no to me, we disconnected. We have no contact, emails, phones or anything for about one and a half years or nearly two years. And until unbeknown to me, God put that desire in her heart again the second time. This time was even stronger than before. And at the same time, God put that desire in my heart because I forgot about it. I put that away. I just switched off. I just thought, I'll forget it. You know, this, this is not the right person. I must have got it wrong. But I was praying to God that God, you showed me this lady, and if that wasn't the right person, because I felt that was mine. She was my wife. She was going to be my wife. But if, it's, if it hasn't, obviously it hasn't happened. So you must have a better plan for me, maybe a better person. But God put that desire in my heart and I contacted her via email and I said, are you still here? I'm still here. And you know, we're not going into details of it again. But what happened was that when we met again, she proposed to me and she said, God put that desire in her heart and things uh, moved on from there and we got married. And we just recently had our 10th wedding anniversary. We have a six-year-old daughter and another boy on his way in a few months. Now, when God joined together a man and a woman, then those two are one body as far as God can see, it's one unity, one entity. God sees a married couple as one. So whatever your spouse does, you can't say, well, that's her business and my business is separate. No, no, no. You're together. You are responsible, both of you are responsible for each other's actions. God sees a married couple as one. He commands the bond of unity. We, we see that in scriptures. He commands the bond of unity in the same way he commands the whole earth, the whole world in fact, into being. Mark chapter 10 verses 8 and 9 read, and the two will become one flesh, one flesh, so that they are no longer two. So you're not living two separate lives totally different from each other, under one roof, calling it marriage. That's not marriage. Not according to God. Not according to the scriptures. And the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, that last part, let no man separate, is a prophecy. Those words, are not just a recommendation. They are even beyond and above a command from God. Let no man separate. It's the same way God said, let there be light. And there was. And anything God says happens. God never uses a single word in vain. We read that in Isaiah chapter 55 Verse 10 to 12 read, For as the rain comes down and the snow from the sky and doesn't return there, but waters the earth and makes it grow and bud and gives seed to the sower and breath to the earth, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish that which I please and it will prosper in things I sent it to do. So whatever he says, it will do it. Those words will do their job. Whatever God says will happen. Whatever he says, he will do. So when, when he says, let there be light, there is light. And when he says, let no man separate, what God has joined. If your marriage is joined together by God, no man can separate. Be assured of that. 
if you join together in marriage by God, no man can separate. No woman can separate. Nothing can separate. Be assured of that. It's a promise of God. God promises there. Let no man separate. Now, people might ask, well, uh, why is there so many divorces in the church then? Well, divorce is a totally different subject and it requires its own sermon. It's a huge subject. But however, a short brief answer to that question would be, it's because of man's will, not God's will. It is not God's will for you to divorce. In fact, God is totally against that, uh, and we'll read about that in a minute. But it's not God's will. Man is forcing it. When I say man, I mean mankind. They're forcing that. They're going against God's law, God's command. They're disobeying God's law. And that will not solve anything. In fact, it will bring lots of curses. Because you're going against what God has said should not be. You're going to do something or you're doing something that God has already said there shouldn't be. Because you're disobeying God's law, God's command. You're going against His word. So you're not going to get any blessings. In fact, you'll bring to your life and upon yourself God's curses. We see that Jesus was also asked a similar question about the lawfulness of divorce. And Jesus explains that Moses allowed divorce then because then your hearts were hardened. But now the laws of God has been written in your hearts and minds. It's not the same anymore. And in fact he explains further and he calls it adultery and the person who is giving away or divorcing his wife, causing her to be a prostitute. A godly married couple will seek God's will for them in their life together and pursue that goal purposefully, which will be evident in everything they do from one day to the next. And they'll have no private confidential matters or affairs from each other. They'll share anything and everything with each other. There is no secret. However, we have to be cautious of the fact that this world is ruled by Satan and all God's principles and standards have been skewed so much to the point that we are to believe good is bad and evil is good. This is the time where Isaiah prophesied about. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 reads, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Satan has managed to create a culture and a society in which the spirit of marriage is being destroyed. Where marriage doesn't mean much more than a couple who may or may not live together under one roof. Only for the purpose of gratifying their sinful nature. Which is why couples living together as partners or civil partners, or even worse, same-sex married couples are given the same rights as legally and lawfully married couples. We are living in a day and age that Satan is using governments, media, and all he can to separate families and destroy the spirit of marriage by instilling in people a culture and a mindset of living separate lives, single lives, even if they're married. A culture and a society in which government agents 
doctors, nurses, police, schools, bankers and other corporates don't talk to you about the affairs or matters of your wife or your husband. I call it private confidential. It's a funny day and age you're living in. These are Satan's attempts to destroy the spirit of marriage and destroy families and separate them. Be aware of that. He is trying to do this by perverting the truth, like he did in the Garden of Eden. However, we're living in this world, but we're not of it, as Jesus said. And so, our model and example of life and the way of life should not be the Word. And in fact, the Word should follow our example. And so, in a marriage made by God between the believers, anything and everything should be shared. And there should be no private or confidential business. A couple who have married each other for no ulterior reason but pure love, which we explained earlier, the kind of love that has stemmed out of their will and that after God putting that desire in their hearts. And it's not out of fleshly desires. They would share anything with each other and they would have no secrets from each other. The acid test for the genuineness of this kind of love, this kind of relationship, would be sharing their possessions with each other. For example, if they have properties, sharing their properties with each other. If they have bank accounts, sharing that with each other. That will show their genuineness. Marriage, once again, is not to be confused with what is widely known as civil partnership or living together. Marriage is sacred and is to be kept holy and honoured by all. The difference between a married couple and a couple simply living together without commitment is that very thing. There is no commitment. And that indicates an underlying sign that one or both parties want to keep the options open for themselves to walk out of the relationship freely without having to go through any rigmarole, any official bureaucracy or paperwork, or having to answer to anyone or be accountable to anyone. Which is why, as we read earlier, God calls it adultery and living in sin and prostitution. When Two people living together and having a sexual relationship. God sees that as a married couple. You don't necessarily have to have a paper. This is a governmental thing. This is a rule of the land. It has nothing to do with God. God sees that, that couple as married. Now, when they don't have any commitment, and they don't want to have any commitment, that means chances are, they will walk out of that relationship. Now, most of you know about the story of the woman at the well that Jesus was talking to. Now, I'll read part of that passage of Scripture in John chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And he whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. So this woman has had five husbands. Now, none of them are registered, obviously, because what Jesus is saying is, I know you're having these affairs, and they're all basically your husbands because you're married to each one of them but even the one that you're living with now he's not your husband either so they are your husband and they're not your husband 
You're living in sin. This is adultery. This is prostitution. Moving on, God also has certain rules for raising a godly family and making sure Satan has no means to penetrate into that family to separate or divide. And also benefit from all the promises of God for your marriage and your family. However, his standards and principles are being more and more trampled upon in our so-called modern society and in each case you'll find the culprit is Satan who is using different means and methods to manipulate people into thinking that what they're doing is just normal. However, I'm not going to explore and analyze all those rules for bringing up a solid godly family in this message. That will be another sermon. But I'm just going to read a few passages of scripture which will be good foundational ground for a married couple to start from. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 3 Let the husband render to his wife the affection owed her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 15 to 21 Drink water out of your own system. Running water out of your own well. Should your spring overflow in the streets, streams of water in the public squares? Let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your spring be blessed, rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe and a graceful deer. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be captivated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be captivated with an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another? For the ways of man are before Yahweh's eyes. He examines all his paths. Colossians chapter 3 verses 18 and 19 Wives, be in subjection to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and don't be bitter against them. I hope you enjoyed this message. Write to us and let us know. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop us an email and let us know. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He shine His face upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Until next time, goodbye.